of mighty cities midst the roar of whirling wheels we are toiling on for hours yet untold and our bosses hope to keep us ever thus beneath their heels and to coin our very lifeblood into gold we must find a way by which every member of society can share in the benefits of industrial progress and wealth and employ the government to work together for the common good. There are very few farmers now who are in the position to start their sons or daughters off with a farm. What a tragedy. Haven't we enough common, ordinary horse sense to set about building a better social system than this? People need jobs, equality, education. The least powerful person in the country Understanding collective bargaining can become the most powerful. And that is what politics is all about. Farmers and laborers, rural and urban working people, saw their dreams for a better life slipping through their fingers. They reached out and joined hands with neighbors and co-workers, forming social and political ties to create the farmer labor movement. But we have a glowing dream of how fair the world will seem when everyone can live their lives secure and free when the earth is owned by labor and there's joy and peace for all in the common world of toil that is to be their alliance challenged a political system corrupted by the corporate monopolies of the day and created a revolution in minnesota politics one that reverberates today the farmer labor movement was both a political party and a grassroots social movement. The key to its success was this connection between politics as we normally understand it and social movement organizing, all directed toward a vision that put the needs of the majority over the interests of the wealthy and the powerful few. The movement created the most successful alternative to the two-party political system in United States history. Farmer laborites brought three Minnesota governors to office, elected four U.S. senators, nine U.S. representatives, and a host of local political leaders. No other third party has held as much power for as long as a Farmer Labor Party did in Minnesota. The party vied with the Republicans to govern the state from 1917 until 1944, when it merged with the Democrats to create the DFL, the Democratic Farmer Labor Party, the only state party in the nation that acknowledges farmers and workers in its name. Farmer laborites challenged economic inequality and monopoly power. Although many of its more sweeping reforms were blocked, Farmer Labor Party achievements ranged from founding state parks to implementing public relief programs and a progressive income tax. The farmer labor movement had a national impact too, prompting federal agriculture, workplace, and unemployment policies. Farmer labor principles continue to influence Minnesota's civic culture and educated citizenry, strong voter participation, social movement activism, and a belief in government for the public good. How did the movement grow and bridge economic, ethnic, and urban rural divides among its members? And how do the farmer laborites' goals and struggles parallel challenges we face today? Looking at the lives of individuals involved in the farmer labor movements helps us answer these questions. From the packing plant in Austin to the co-ops in Fargo In the city and the country, wherever you may go Through the wild and windy weather, through the sun and sleet and rain Comes a whistling through the country, this farmer labor train Socialist William Mahoney edited St. Paul's Union Advocate newspaper and led the Labor Assembly. He believed an independent party was the workers' best strategy for changing society's unfair income distribution. We must organize the workers into a solid economic and political force. Susie Stegeberg was born on an Iowa farm. She taught in country classrooms and Sunday school. Her Lutheran faith informed her political activism. As editor of the Red Wing Organized Farmer, Susie had credibility with rural voters. She persuaded farm activists to join workers in the new political movement, earning her the title Mother of the Farmer Labor Party. We all prosper or suffer together. Workers and farmers need a new political party. 
with a program and candidates all our own. In 1924, Mahoney and Stegeberg brought together a coalition unique in the history of American politics. More than a political party, the Farmer Labor Association was the grassroots core of the movement, designed to educate, organize, and represent the two great producing classes, the farmers and the workers. She's rolling from the farm fields on the Red Wings River shore. The association, through its member organizations and local clubs, developed platforms reflecting farmers' and workers' interests. Then they made sure their elected Farmer Labor Party officials honored those platforms. Members of other political groups, including populists, socialists, and communists, joined the movement, often debating and sometimes clashing over its direction. The direct model and catalyst for the movement was the Nonpartisan League that arose in the neighboring state of North Dakota. When the lawyer hangs around while the butcher cuts a pound, the farmer is the one who feeds them all. Wheat farmers in North Dakota could not make ends meet. The flour milling industry was really guided by and directed by, and all the profits were funneled toward these Minneapolis companies. And that left these farmers in the lurch. Squeezed between high loan rates from commercial banks and low payments for their crops from grain elevators and flour mills, farmers suffered poverty, and they faced losing their land. Then they take them by the hand, and they lead them from the land, and the middleman's the one who gets it all. Flax grower Arthur C. Townley and others convinced thousands of North Dakota farmers that it was time to elect their own political leaders. Farm families organized the Nonpartisan League in 1915 and nominated candidates to run for state offices within the Republican Party. By 1918, North Dakotans elected a Nonpartisan League governor and a majority in the legislature, and these leaders made good on their platform. They established a state-owned flour mill, grain elevator, and bank, enterprises that still operate today. The movement's focus on economic issues brought people together across powerful racial and ethnic divides. African American farmers became active members of the League. Labor and civil rights leader Nellie Stone Johnson was born to William Allen, a farmer, and Gladys Allen, a teacher in 1905. She grew up on farms in Minnesota's Dakota and Pine Counties. My dad was a member of the Nonpartisan League. I was very familiar with the League and read many of the papers. I was 13 doing the distribution of literature to the farmers. I just propped the material up on the horse's saddle horn so I could read it. Nonpartisan league gains inspired organizing among farmers in northwestern Minnesota and beyond. Their goals and successes attracted workers in cities, too, despite traditional tension between urban labor and rural farmers. What brings these two groups together is a streetcar strike that occurs in St. Paul in 1917. When no one else stood with Minneapolis and St. Paul workers during the streetcar strike, the nonpartisan league stood behind them, donated funds, and spoke out on their behalf. And they began to see that their interests were really not so different after all. As a marker of this growing cooperation, the Farmer-Oriented Nonpartisan League moved its headquarters to St. Paul in 1917. There, William Mahoney saw that the League model could enable organized workers to strengthen their political power too. He founded the Workers' Nonpartisan Political League. Like the Farmers' NPL, it wasn't a party, but a member-driven organization pushing for social change. It soon had thousands of members across Minnesota. Members of both branches of the Nonpartisan League nominated the progressive congressman from Little Falls, Charles A. Lindbergh Sr., as their candidate to challenge the incumbent, Governor Bernquist, in the Minnesota Republican primary. In the joint rally that followed, farmers and workers celebrated. League President Arthur C. Townley addressed the final session. Farmers of Minnesota, is there any hatred in your heart toward organized labor? No! Those of you who pledge allegiance to the workers of the city will stand. Thousands of Minnesota farmers jump to their feet. Workers of the city, if you likewise pledge your allegiance to the farmers of Minnesota, please stand. Immediately, 
the rest of the 7,000 people in the auditorium were on their feet. Hats sailed through the air. Men and women cried. The cheers were tumultuous. The growing power of a united rural and urban working people's movement was viewed as a threat by big business and the party in power. League organizing took place during the height of U.S. involvement in World War I. The Republican administration, aided by the Home Guard and Main Street Patriots, carried on a campaign of harassment, branding both farm and labor militants as disloyal and jailing leaders for sedition. There were people hung in effigy and there were actual people tarred and feathered. It was a, a violent campaign. In 1917, the legislature set up a special Minnesota Commission of Public Safety to suppress dissent. Members of the Public Safety Commission who directed it were mostly corporate leaders from Minneapolis. They saw this as an opportunity to extend their power across the state and deal with a number of the challenges to their power in Minneapolis through violating what today we would see as basic civil liberties. John F. McGee became de facto leader of the commission that targeted groups well beyond opponents of the war. The League worker is a traitor. Where we made our mistake is in not establishing a firing squad in the first days of the war. We should now get busy and have that firing squad working overtime. The disloyal element in Minnesota is largely among the German and Swedish people. The Public Safety Commission, in trying to take care of its perceived enemies across the state, that brings farmers and laborers together. They all experience this repression. That really did cause people to, to think about where their political uh, Loyalties really ought to lie, and who's going to be on their side? Strong hand, son of the sword, he is toiling hard from the cradle. Miners on the Iron Range had experienced repression for decades. The Steel Trust sought to drive wedges between ethnic groups to prevent workers from organizing unions. The repercussions for pro labor views or actions were severe, as miners, like French Corsican immigrant John Bernard, learned. In those days, the wages were mighty low. The miners were getting $2.10 a day for 10 hours work. So I would say to these miners, why don't you have a union here? But they had two pigeons in the mines. That's how I, be. I was blacklisted. I was sent home. Finns were especially engaged in organizing the mines and especially targeted for their activism. The Finns were largely blacklisted from the mines. The thing was, you bought your, your food and your stuff from the company store, and the company store wouldn't give you credit if you were on strike. As a result of that, the cooperative movement grew by leaps and bounds after the 1907 strike, because this was a place that was geared for workers and that would support workers no matter what. Consumer cooperatives became an important part of life on the range. The Northern Cooperative League, rooted in the radical Finnish tradition, operated dozens of co-op stores in the region. Everybody really relied on the co-op. The whole feeling was if your community is strong, you can survive. If you're on your own as an individual, you're probably not going to make it. It's making sure that we own our community and that that community serves the people of the community, not corporate interests or someone else. While mining communities supported consumer co-ops, farmers turned to producer co-ops. By jointly owning and operating storage and processing facilities, farmers could reduce costs and keep a larger portion of the income their produce earned. Farmers felt they were getting ripped off on quality, quantity, or price. They took it in their own hands, formed a co-op to get a fair shake. Dad became one of the charter members of the Twin Cities Milk Producers Association, set up to counteract the middleman. With all the cheating going on, it didn't take much to organize those dairy farmers. Rural producer co-ops and consumer co-ops in towns and cities multiplied and formed alliances. The New York Times reported that Minnesota had more co-ops than any other state, a distinction it still holds today. Co-ops became a critical strand of the Farmer Labor Coalition, some as organizational members of the association and as the source of ideas for the collectivist ideology of the movement. There is power, there is power in the band of working folk when they stand hand in hand. That's a power, that's a power. 
Duluth was a labor town. It had one of the strongest labor movements in the country. And then the Steel Trust arrived and gradually crushed the labor movement. And so in the first two decades of the 20th century, there was the crushing and then the beginning of a resistance and fight back. I grew up in Duluth, up in the hills, a community we call Little Jerusalem. There was an enormous amount of anti-Semitism. The first time they called me a sheeny, they made me a communist. Discrimination came not only from neighborhood kids. Irene's revered third grade teacher told her class that undesirables from other countries were a blight on America. From that time on, I never accepted authority unless I tested it in the crucible of my own experience. Well, it was only one short step there from being conscious of my oppression as a Jew, as a girl, to being conscious of the oppression of blacks. Right after World War I, three blacks were hanged from a pole in Duluth on First Street because they were accused of raping a woman in the circus. That made a tremendous impact on me. Irene became an organizer and writer, supporting farmer labor ideals. She was not alone in her outrage over the social order. Voters took major steps toward reversing corporate dominance of Minnesota politics. 1918 was kind of a pivotal year. People launched the Duluth Working Men's Party. A railroad engineer, Congressman Carves, was elected to represent Duluth in Congress. And that was the beginning of the farmer labor movement in Duluth. The movement gained ground in elections across the state, too. Although nonpartisan lead candidate Lindbergh lost the Republican primary to Governor Bernquist, the coalition stayed together and won a strong foothold in the legislature. The 1918 campaign encouraged farmers and trade unionists to build a new, independent political organization. Over the next six years, the two nonpartisan leagues came together with other progressive groups to form the Independent Farmer Labor Association, the educational and organizational center of the movement. The electoral arm, the Farmer Labor Party, grew larger than the Democrats and won more offices every election. Every man now has the ballot None you know have we But we have brains and we can use them Just as well as he In 1922, two years after women got the right to vote, union organizer and farmer laborite Myrtle Kane was among the first of four women elected to the Minnesota legislature. I introduced the first equal rights for women law to be introduced in any state legislature. These discriminations by race and sex all along the line should be done away with once and for all. Kane also pioneered a successful bill to challenge the Ku Klux Klan, making it a misdemeanor for members of groups to conceal their identities in public with masks or robes. The legislation was the first anti-masking bill ever passed in the nation. Fifteen other states followed suit. The success and inclusiveness of the farmer labor movement flowed from the organization's framework. What the Farmer Labor Party and Farmer Labor Association understood was this idea that in order to have an ongoing successful movement, you need to have three things. One is you needed to have a clear vision and program that you are working toward that will actually make a difference in, in working people's lives and farmers' lives. And a set of values that underlies that program, primarily the idea of solidarity. Second, we need to have grassroots organizing year-round. And then thirdly, you need to have a political vehicle, a party. So the party is based on the organizing, the organizing and party are all about the vision and the platform. Those three parts of the triangle actually really, to me, constitute what was a unique contribution of the farmer labor movement. It had a strategy of change. The Depression both undermined the lives of millions and fueled hopes and militant action to create a new society. All I want is the right to live, mister. Give me back my job again. 
While much of the country was spinning in confusion, Minnesota's farmer labor movement was ready to respond quickly to the crisis of the Depression with an organization, a program, and tested leadership. In 1930, voters elected a substantial farmer labor delegation to the State House of Representatives, and they made the charismatic Floyd B. Olson governor. The Farmer Labor Party does not wish to confiscate the property of anyone. What we want is to create an economic system so that we can produce enough wealth to satisfy the needs of all the people. We want every man, woman, and child in the United States to have enough to eat. We want every man, woman, and child to have a decent home to live in and decent clothing to wear. What had appeared radical in the 1920s seemed like um, kind of the lifesaver in the 1930s. I mean, there was real doubt that capitalism was even going to survive with 25, 30 percent unemployment. The contrast between the response to the depression offered by the traditional parties versus the farmer laborites was clear in a 1932 gubernatorial debate. The state and national governments have engaged in a wild orgy of spending. I pledge to cut every appropriation 20%. The present administration has lacked the courage and foresight to cut expenses. All I hear people talking about is their rising taxes. I disagree that people are only talking of taxes. The people of this nation today are talking mostly about eating, and the farmers are talking about getting the cost of production for their crops. We're going to go to the Capitol and we're going to change state policy. We're going to talk about food, schooling, health care. And all of these things emerge through farmer labor organizing. And it also, I think, opened up all of these opportunities for women to be much more politically active and much more visible. There is power, there is power, working women, working men, when they stand hand in hand. From its very inception, the founders of the party believed in the equality of women. They believed in and spoke out for equal pay, which is way ahead of their time. The association adopted a quota, unheard of at the time, one woman to every two men on the state committee. Women developed their own organization within the association, the Women's Federation. Federation women battled against discriminatory wage scales. They took on the relief department in Minneapolis when it refused to hire young married women. The Federation took on the Farmer Labor Association too. It advocated for policies that made family living conditions and fair access to relief of equal importance with workplace issues. Touch the toil and sorrow in the soil where the greenbacks never grow on what I borrow. The farmer labor movement also supported community efforts to relieve the rural economic crisis. In southwestern Minnesota, farms boasted fertile earth that produced plentiful harvests and well-fed pigs and cattle. World War I brought high crop and livestock prices. Land values and interest rates shot up too. After the war ended, demand for farmers' products and the prices they could get for them crashed. But the high rates on loans they'd taken on in the boom years stayed the same. If you incur a debt, Let's say corn is 80 cents a bushel, and you try to pay for it when it is two cents a bushel. It doesn't make any difference how hard you work. You can't do it. And farmers were losing their farms. Since 1914, the Bush family had farmed a 300-acre homestead southeast of Wilmer. John Bush was all too familiar with the economic squeeze farmers faced. To Governor Olson and John Bush, dear sir, I'm writing to you on account of our condition. We haven't even writing paper to write on. Now we've got to have work or some way to keep our family alive. It hurts to hear the children cry for bread and you haven't got it to give them. We need help immediately. Trusting, I am yours truly, Mrs. E. W. Pagel. The Pagels were among thousands of farmers and rural workers who looked to John Bush and the Farm Holiday Association for help. In 1932, John was elected state president of the new organization, an offshoot of the Farmers Union. The Farm Holiday Association advocated nonviolent collective action to save family farms. Members demanded that prices for agricultural goods be set above the cost of producing them. Their first tactic was to strike, withholding dairy, livestock, and crops from the market to boost prices. They dumped their milk, they wouldn't sell their milk. 
They tried to block the trucks to, that were hauling livestock to the South St. Paul. They throw a spike plank across the highway. But coordinating thousands of independent farmers desperate for income from perishable foodstuffs proved daunting. The strike had fizzled, the strike had failed, and they called that off and they concentrated on the mortgage moratoriums and preventing foreclosures after that. Come along, all workers come along, help the union to grow strong. While the Farm Holiday Association was organizing for fair prices from companies that processed animals they raised, workers inside the Hormel meatpacking plant were building their own movement. Frank Ellis led the drive to unionize the Austin, Minnesota plant. His whole life had prepared him for the role. Hell, I belong to the uh, Cook Waiters and Waitress Union. Them, uh, I joined several different unions, and whatever, if there was a union, I joined it because I'd learned that in early life, you know, I believed in it. Frank's father was a farmer. While plowing, he suffered a serious injury and infection that paralyzed one of his feet. Unable to farm, he went to work for a Swift & Company meatpacking plant. A grease pipe busted above him, and he started to jump out from under that grease pipe, and his foot slipped and he fell into a sewer there and broke that bum leg all to pieces, and they had to have it cut off, and that killed him. That's all there was to it. No compensation of any kind. I went to work at Hormel's over here in 28, down at Austin. I run a gang there at Hormel's for five years. The work had become short weeks, cut pay, and here comes the foreman to insist that you sign a card uh, saying that you'll allow them to take money out of your pay uh, to go to the community chest. And as the story is told, one of the workers said, uh, they expect us to help the poor people. Well, we are the poor people. Uh, they started a sit-down strike and they occupied the plant. This was in November of 1933. It was the nation's first sit-down strike. Jay Hormel and other business leaders had been lobbying for Governor Olson to send the National Guard to Austin to open up the plant, citing chaos in the streets. Instead, Olson went to Austin to see the situation for himself. He saw disciplined, peaceful pickets surrounding the plant. He met with both sides at the Fox Hotel and mediated an end to the strike. And at the end of three days, Jay Hormel gave in. And that union negotiated one of the most remarkable union contracts ever. They're going to get a stable wage every week, and they can't be laid off for 52 weeks. Needless to say, workers around the state of Minnesota and workers around the upper Midwest heard about this and were inspired by this. This was the breakthrough. And we start in organizing cooks, waiters, waitresses, bartenders, barmaids, and automobile workers and truck drivers and what have you. And we organized under the independent union of all workers. And we got them organized solid. And when we were once organized, we were the power. We're going to roll, we're going to roll, we're going to roll the union on. The union staged sit-down strikes to organize meat packers and appliance manufacturing workers in Albert Lee, Minnesota. The inclusive unionizing model spread to Cedar Rapids, Mason City, and Omaha. This militant energy inspired activism in the Twin Cities, too. Labor organizing ramped up in Minneapolis to challenge the U.S. capital of anti-unionism enforced by the Citizens' Alliance. The Citizens' Alliance was begun shortly after the turn of the 20th century, primarily driven by big business, the banks in particular. And their goal was to keep unions out of Minneapolis. In 1934, workers saw an opportunity to breach the wall of employers' refusal to recognize unions. The Teamsters called a massive trucker strike. Strikers fought Citizens' Alliance members and police in hand-to-hand -hand street battles. Police shot roving picketers. The violence cost four lives. The Olson Farmer Labor Administration aimed to keep order by detaining pickets and closing both the Citizens' Alliance and strikers' headquarters. The strike was finally settled when, 
At the governor's urging, the Roosevelt administration intervened by threatening to call back federal loans made to Citizens Alliance banks. This strike, together with conflicts in California and Ohio, catalyzed pressure to pass the 1935 National Labor Relations Act. It made collective bargaining the law of the land. The Farm Holiday Association sent food to the striking workers. Nellie's father, William Allen, a member of the association, joined in the support. The old man was bringing potatoes and rutabagas down to feed the Teamsters. I don't even remember how many truckloads he brought up. Farmers also brought food to striking Strutware Knitting Company workers, the majority of them women. Women at the factory, who were not organized at all in the hosiery workers, start to organize among themselves and come out on strike. And then the Teamsters basically halt all delivery to the factory. So the fact that the Farmer Labor Association is out there supporting what appears to be a relatively small strike of hosiery workers has a lot to do with their understanding of the strategic pressure points in the Minneapolis political economy, which will allow them to open the city up to union organization and to a much more progressive politics. Nellie Allen had been fired in 1924 for talking about having a union at the elite Minneapolis Athletic Club, where she worked as the employee elevator operator. The climate for organizing had changed when she got her job back in 1934. She organized the workers who got on and off her elevator. The corporate world, the power structure, looked around and saw the Farmer Labor Party taking one office after another. That played a role in helping us organize. That there was a political group of people supported by labor. The growing threat of a tight union organization made them treat us more carefully. We also made it clear that whites and blacks would be treated the same. The workers joined the Hotel and Restaurant Employees Union as Local 655. Nellie later used her union's position on the Central Labor Board to push for hiring black teachers in Minneapolis. And, and Nellie was a very intense person. And usually what she said, these politicians went out and did. While supporting union strikers and the Farmer Labor Coalition, the Farm Holiday Association was using its own collective tactics to halt foreclosures across the region. Yeah, and so they had what they call a penny auction. And uh, they bid this stuff back in at pennies. What am I bid for the cow? What am I bid for the cow? Five cents for the cow. And then they give it back to the farmer after it was done. 10 cents for the tractor. But after a while, in certain counties like Swift County and Lockheed Parle County and places like that, there weren't that many sales held because the holiday had so much strength. So creditors began negotiating with the association instead of forcing families off their land. It was one thing to challenge the local sheriff's power, quite another to defy federal authorities as the Farm Holiday Association did in Montevideo. It was a day perfect for thrashing. But within a radius of 20 miles around Montevideo, there wasn't a thrashing rig going. There was a scheduled foreclosure sale, and they, they shut down the thrashing, and everybody went to town crowded. The town was full of people as far as South Dakota, Iowa, North Dakota, and, and the poor U.S. Marshal. <laughs> Actually, I felt sorry for him. He had a bodyguard. He said, I'm here with the judge's order in my pocket, and he patted his gun when someone hit the marshal. I turned him around and I told him, there's about 6,000 of us here. You don't need to do that. The marshal called the federal judge. The judge said, you can't do this. It's illegal. Harry Hogland says, we understand that, but we're doing it. They stopped the foreclosure. Just after that gathering, John Bush got a call from Governor Olson. Governor Olson told me he had a call from the president. He called me to tell me specifically. He knows you and he thinks you're doing a tremendous job, but you can't buck the federal government. You're going to spend the rest of your life in the pen. Well, I said, now, Floyd, up till now, we've hurt no one. 
You'll put me in the pen if it takes 10,000, 100,000. It takes I don't know how many. I'm not going to stay there. If you want a civil war, if that's what you're aiming for, that's the way you'll get it. Instead of arrests, the militant, unified actions of the Association on Farms and in a mass rally at the Minnesota Capitol gained a state foreclosure moratorium. And at the urging of President Roosevelt, Congress passed a law providing subsidies to farmers in exchange for cutting production. We built dams and bridges by the score, just leaning on a shovel and lots of housing for the poor. Chester Watson was born on a farm near Aiken, Minnesota. He attended Carleton College and had formal training in music. He worked in Hollywood as a film actor and singer. Chester also took a job in California as a probation officer. I became discouraged because society was creating more poverty, or through poverty, was creating more delinquents than social workers could take care of. And so, I quit the job. I had a hard time making my living back there, and I can remember going for several days on the road without having anything to eat. And of course, this was my first taste of being unemployed. Chester returned to Minnesota, to Rochester, where he worked as a social worker, was active in the Farmer Labor Association, and ran for Congress. He was fired for helping get relief for wives and families of men who had been jailed. And it was during this time that unemployment got worse. And we'd have boys up at the state reformatory at St. Cloud for stealing a few chickens from some neighbors in order to go to a dance on a Saturday night, and cases of people stealing hay to feed their cattle. Chester was recruited as president of the Minnesota Workers' Alliance and devoted himself to the cause of the unemployed. We had day-to-day -day struggles of people coming into the office or coming to meetings, telling us what their situation was, where they had been denied relief, medical care, and we would take them to the relief office and see if we couldn't get this case straightened out. We had close to 40,000 people join the Workers' Alliance in the first year that I was president of that organization. We went to businessmen and we'd say, look here, Mr. Merchant, we want you to sign this, asking for more WPA jobs from Congress. If we can get work and are paid for this work, we will be able to pay our bills at the grocery store, to the dentist and the doctor, and we'll be able to pay our rent. And so we had merchant after merchant that would say, yes, I want you for customers and I'm very glad to sign this for you. The Workers' Alliance kept the unemployed associated with the labor movement and brought together white workers and black workers in a common struggle. When the earth is owned by labor and there's joy and peace for all in the common world of toil that is to be. By the 1934 Farmer Labor State Convention, the connection between grassroots activism with the responsive government bore fruit. Floyd Olson fired up the convention when he declared, Now I am frank to say that I am not a liberal. I enjoy working on a common basis with liberals for their platforms, but I am not a liberal. I am what I want to be. I am a radical. I want, however, an orderly, a sane, and a constructive change. Then we'll sing one song of the workers' commonwealth, full of beauty, full of love and health. The following day, farmer labor convention delegates passed the famous Cooperative Commonwealth Platform, a Magna Carta of American left-wing politics. It was the most uh, radical sort of platform ever passed by a major political party. Its preamble said capitalism has failed and we must replace it with a system uh, called a cooperative commonwealth. It called for public ownership of major banks and utilities and other things, not for total public ownership. For many middle-of-the-road farmer laborites, the platform simply went too far. Agricultural co-ops were one thing, but the state ownership section seemed to threaten private ownership itself. Olson won the next election for a third term as governor, but the Farmer Labor Party lost its majority in the state house, slowing the pace of progressive governmental reforms. As Olson decided not to seek a fourth term as governor, delegates at the 1936 Farmer Labor Convention endorsed him for the United States Senate. However, Olson was gravely ill, 
On August 22, 1936, he died at Rochester's Mayo Clinic of stomach cancer. Many Minnesotans felt a personal connection to Floyd Olson. 200,000 grieving people filed past the much-beloved governor's coffin in silent tribute. Elmer Benson, a prairie populist from Appleton, Minnesota, won the 1936 Farmer Labor Endorsement for governor, edging out Yalmer Peterson, the former lieutenant governor who became governor upon Olson's death. Benson was a favorite of party progressives. Sympathy for Governor Olson, the popularity of President Roosevelt, and support for the New Deal policies implemented by the farmer laborites brought landslide victories for the party. In addition to Benson's win, the Farmer Labor Party elected five congressmen, a U.S. Senator, and a working majority in the State House of Representatives, its most impressive victory. The margin of the electoral wins enabled the Benson administration to put movement ideas into practice and expand support for unions and progressive farm groups. The victories demonstrated the farmer labor movement's appeal across the urban-rural divide and across traditional ethnic divisions. John T. Bernard ran for office in 1936 on the farmer labor ticket. He ran for 8th District Congress, and he was an immigrant. When John T. Bernard won that election, he won 70% of the vote, and he beat a Democratic and a Republican candidate. He won across all ethnic groups, and that had never happened before that. If you want to join a union, step in and come along. We'll all be glad to have you. We're many a thousand strong. Join the CIO. The Benson administration came into office as the newly formed Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO, focused on organizing long unrepresented workers. A cascade of campaigns to create new unions was underway. Governor Benson and the Farmer Labor Party were ready and eager to support this union tide in Minnesota. The solidarity between farmers and workers emboldened them to stand up to some of their most powerful opponents in northern Minnesota, the lumber companies. There's lumberjacks from White Earth and folks in factories. Garment workers in Minneapolis and cooks in Albert Lee. White Earth Ojibwe organizer Fred LaCour was elected president of the Minnesota Timber Workers Union. He led it through the first of two strikes in 1937. We are the Minnesota Lumberjacks, the most exploited group of workers in the state. The lumber barons in the Northwest have dealt with us as ruthlessly as they laid waste our great natural resource, the Minnesota forests. Having witnessed massive fires on cut over timber areas, farmer laborites saw the need to protect the land. That impulse of sustainable stewardship became an important strand of farmer labor policy. A major plank of the Cooperative Commonwealth Platform stated the necessity of safeguarding the land for everyone. Farmer Labor Senator Shipstead co-authored a bill preserving the Boundary Waters area, the nation's first Congressional Wilderness Preservation Statute. Sixteen state parks were established during farmer labor administrations, and the Department of Conservation was founded. The lumber companies have taken to contracting out lumbering. So you've got small operators working on thin margins. Men are housed in these big camps in the woods. There are several hundred of these camps across northern Minnesota. And their complaints are not only about their wages and their hours and their dangers on the jobs, but they're also very much about the living conditions. Crowded bunks with no ventilation, no showers, straw to sleep on infected with bugs, so the lumberjacks organize. They had found a voice in the CIO. All of a sudden, thousands of them rose out of the camps, just like the trees out of the woods they came, walking trees. Irene was working at the Paul Law office when Joe Liss, a timber workers union steward, walked in. And he says, why are you sitting at that bourgeois typewriter and doing this bourgeois work? You belong down at strike headquarters. We need someone to help us. We don't have a stenographer. We don't have anything. 
And here you are. Shame on you. <laughs> he didn't even know me, you know. And so I said to Hank, Hank, they need me down in strike headquarters. He said, well, then go. So <laughs> I not only took away his secretary, I took away his typewriter. <laughs> Irene traveled around the camps, talking to timber workers in mess halls and bunkhouses, writing down the stories they told her. Such a lot of devils, that's what the papers say. Because the mainstream press was had this anti-worker approach to covering the strike, they needed to reach people directly. And they also needed to keep their own members informed about what was going on. They created a newspaper called The Timber Worker. Irene Paul and her cousin, Sam Davis, wrote and edited the paper, which later became the regional CIO newspaper, Midwest Labor. Farmers had also been harmed by the timber companies. They cut down all the forests and then they resold that cut over land to people who came and settled as farmers, only to discover that clearing all those stumps and the sort of acidic soils of a pine forest did not make for very good growing conditions. And so by 1937, a lot of people were losing their farms, unable to even make a living. They were really struggling. And so they saw the timber workers strike as their own struggle. And they started going and just reaching out to farmer labor clubs that were organized across the state to tell their story and to ask for support, and they overwhelmingly got it. All of these uh, letters that pour into the governor's office. Governor Benson made state relief available to strikers and opened up the Duluth Armory to those who had lost their lumber camp housing. Elmer Benson sent in a truckload of grapefruit to striking lumberjacks and also uh, used uh, troops to protect the strikers. I mean, this is amazing. This is the United States of America, where the, the army always intervenes on the side of the companies and suppresses the labor movement. And here the governor is sending in troops to protect the workers? Wow! <laughs> the timber workers won their two strikes. They say they'll win the strike or put the bosses on the bum. In Albert Lee, Benson intervened personally during the American Gas Machine Company strike. He waded into a crowd of 2,000 labor supporters, confronting machine gun armed law enforcement and deputies. He ordered an end to the standoff. Then he convened an all-night meeting to negotiate an end to the strike. What made Benson beloved in labor-friendly cities and northern Minnesota made enemies among big business. But the banks are made On April 5, 1937, Fred LaCour, Chester Watson, and leaders of other farmer labor association groups addressed more than 1,000 people at the state capitol. The crowd came to lobby legislators to pass Governor Benson's relief bill. 200 protesters peacefully occupied the Senate chamber overnight. Governor Benson addressed the people's lobby. The great majority of the people, 95% or more, are ordinary, plain, common folks. These are the people that are producing the wealth keeping our government going. And if we would use our common sense, we would make this country the finest, happiest place in the world to live in. At the request of Governor Benson, the occupiers left the chamber the next morning. Republicans felt the people's lobby had gone too far and called for Benson's impeachment. While the Farmer Labor Party was at the height of its power, many Minnesotans felt excluded or alienated by Benson's staunchly progressive approach. Business owners complained, Floyd Olson used to say all those things, but this son of a bitch Benson really means them. Divisions that had been festering inside the Farmer Labor Association now burst out into the open. Especially damaging was the conflict between the AFL craft unions that had been at the core of the movement and the emerging industrial unions organized by the CIO. Governor Benson strongly supported the new movement, causing resentment among old AFL allies like William Mahoney. Conflict with left-wing members led Mahoney to leave the Farmer Labor Party he helped create. Communists had shunned the Farmer Labor Party, and at times, they were barred as members. But through most of the movement's history, communists worked alongside socialists, populists, and other members of the coalition to improve the lives of working people. By 1935, the on and off-again relationship of communists within the Farmer Labor Party was reset. 
To fight racism and fascism, cooperation with progressives became official communist international policy in what became known as the Popular Front. Former Governor Yalmer Peterson announced his intention to challenge Benson in the 1938 farmer labor primary. The themes he sounded served both himself and the Republicans and appealed to a growing Silver Shirts fascist movement in Minnesota. I abhor the communist teachings of overthrow of government by revolution and the destruction of the church. I would rather be defeated without the support of this un-American element than elected with it. I will not bargain with those seeking to lead us from the principles of our party and our departed leaders. I will not deal with men who do not recognize that Christianity is the foundation of civilization. The Republican Party had come around, um, and so by 1938, they were recognizing the reality of the problems that the Farmer Labor Party had been addressing and even accepting some of the solutions that the Farmer Labor Party had been offering. The Republican Party waged two campaigns in 1938. One, led by gubernatorial candidate Harold Stassen himself, took the high road. The other, not acknowledged but not repudiated by the candidate, plumbed the depths of anti-communism and anti-Semitism. The Stassen campaign was saying that Benson was run by international Jewish bankers. Benson lost the 1938 election, as did many farmer laborites, including Congressman John Bernard. Now, after that election, there's a three-way fight. There's the Republicans, there's the Farmer Labor Party, and the Democrats. And the Republicans are the biggest vote-getters of those three camps. So that leads then to the idea that the Democrats and the Farmer Labor Party should unite so that they can win the elections against the Republicans. Farmer labor candidates for statewide office continued to outpoll the Democrats, but were defeated by the Republicans in 1940 and 42. With the U.S. entry into World War II and an improved economy, popular support declined for the Farmer Labor Party's militant anti-monopoly policies. And the ideological gap with the Democrats narrowed as the party had become more progressive through FDR's New Deal platform. Farmer laborite Nellie Stone Johnson met Democrat Hubert Humphrey on campus when she attended the University of Minnesota. They became friends and allies. Both sought to bring their two parties together. But a lot of farmer laborites and Democrats were bitterly opposed to combining the two parties. And it was a tough negotiation because there was suspicion between the two groups. Finally, in the spring of 1944, fusion was effected. And both sides thought when the agreement was made that they'd be able to really capture control of the merged party. Political unity within the DFL did not survive past the end of World War II. Farmer labor opposition to the economic and Cold War policies of the Truman administration met head on with the corporate liberalism of the Democrats. A struggle for control of the new party raged over the next four years. The farmer labor branch of the DFL lost much of its influence. Ultimately, the Democratic wing soundly defeated the former farmer laborites. By May of 1948, Marion Lesseur had enough. She resigned her post as vice chairwoman of the party, spelling out her reasons in a letter to the party chair. Why should we go further into an insane struggle for power, pitting neighbor against neighbor over false issues and name calling? The Democratic Party has become a part of the bipartisan party of the monopolies, which are the enemies of the people everywhere. Liberal concerns about Soviet strength and domestic subversion, coupled with conservative resistance to social change, fueled the anti-communist suspicions, which led to McCarthyism. Some farmer laborites suffered serious consequences, questioned before a congressional committee, fired, blacklisted, or harassed by the FBI. The fear of being branded a communist or a communist sympathizer discouraged many from passing on their farmer labor experience to following generations. Living memory seems to have been severed. The Farmer Labor Party ceased to be a separate political force after the DFL merger. 
but progressive ideas, policies, and institutions established by the farmer labor movement are still strong in Minnesota today. They called us wild-eyed Bolsheviks. Starry-eyed radicals was the kindest thing they said. Never, it's impossible. This is utterly impossible, you know? Social security, unemployment insurance. You see how the impossible becomes possible. How do we stand up the corporate entities that want to continue to extract and do with our allies, the working people of the state? I got the same pay that the men got, and it's because of things that Nellie had fought for to make those unions happen. Grassroots politics really made the difference, shaped the policy, and changed the world, at least in Minnesota. Organize her, unionize her, make the bright star of right shine above. Make the railroads and the factories and the farmlands all our own. We'll make America our own sweet home. We'll make America our own sweet home. Thank you.